on World News Tonight. Djokovic dejected. Is this the end of the road for Djokovic? Will the number one men's tennis player put his resolve ahead of his ambition? Will we ever see Djokovic at a Grand Slam again? Find out tonight. No tickets. As expected, the 2022 Winter Olympics will commence without spectators yet again. This comes as Beijing reported cases of Omicron just days before the event. Progressive EU. Roberta Metzola cements rise to European Parliament presidency, making her the third woman president to be elected. This comes as European leaders pay their last respect to the president, David Sassoli. And it's playtime. An unusual group of friends take the maximum advantage of enjoying themselves in the snow. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with the latest on the Tennis Champs saga. Just days after missing the Australian Open and being deported from Australia because he was unvaccinated, Novak Djokovic found out he may be barred from the upcoming Grand Slam tournaments on the tennis calendar as well. Novak Djokovic may not be allowed to defend his French Open title in May after the French government ruled that all athletes will have to be vaccinated in order to attend and compete in sporting events in France. And it's not just the French Open. Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez said today that Djokovic would have to follow his country's Covid rules to participate in the Madrid Open in April. Spain currently requires visitors to show full proof of vaccination, a recent PCR negative test within 72 hours before arrival or a certificate of having recovered from COVID-19. The two final Grand Slam tournaments of 2022, Wimbledon in late June and the US Open in late August could also be problematic for Djokovic. Plumes of smoke are still clouding up the atmosphere in Tonga. Aid agencies reported extensive damage in the Pacific island nation of Tonga following a massive underwater volcanic blast and tsunami as the first death from the disaster was confirmed. This is the volcanic island of Harpai seen by satellite before Saturday's eruption. And now after, the underwater terrain has completely disappeared. From Monday night, the islands of Tonga have been completely cut off from the world. The only undersea communications cable in the kingdom has been severed by the violent eruption. It may take up to two weeks to re-establish connections to the telephone and the internet. The Red Cross says it's finding it difficult to do its work on the ground. The combination of ashfall and the tsunami waves will have caused water contamination. So we imagine one of the greatest needs is to provide water purification and clean drinking water. We imagine that is priority number one, actually. New Zealand and Australia have sent military surveillance planes to assess the extent of the damage from the sky. The eruption caused a column of smoke more than 20 kilometres high, which was so powerful that it caused a tsunami. The shockwave was so strong that it could be heard in Alaska more than 9,000 kilometres away. It's caused damage as far away as Peru due to abnormally high waves. Tongans living overseas face an anxious wait for news of their families. China says tickets to upcoming Beijing Winter Olympics will only be offered to pre-selected spectators. Organizers say the measure was inevitable to prevent the spread of COVID-19. This is not surprising as China is strictly adhering to the zero COVID policy. Only select spectators will be able to attend the Beijing Winter Olympics in person due to concerns over the spread of the Omicron variant. This comes as organizers announced Monday that no tickets will be sold for the Winter Olympic and Paralympic Games due to the, quote, grave and complicated situation of the pandemic. Instead, they said they would invite groups of spectators to attend the Games in person. They also explained the invited spectators will strictly abide by COVID-19 countermeasures to ensure the safe running of the Games. The measures come as Chinese President Xi Jinping underscored Beijing's confidence in making the Games a success during a virtual address to the 2022 Economic Forum. We are confident that China will present a streamlined, safe and splendid Games to the world. The official motto for Beijing 2022 is together for a shared future. Indeed, let us join hands with full confidence and work together for a shared future. 
Earlier, the International Olympic Committee said tickets will only be sold to spectators living in mainland China who meet certain COVID-19 safety requirements. During the games, athletes will not be required to get COVID-19 vaccinations, but those who are unvaccinated will have to spend 21 days in quarantine upon arrival in the Chinese capital. Over in the United States, Mother Nature is showing her powers yet again. Winter weather alerts remain in effect in the U.S. across northern New England and the Great Lakes after the storm barreled across and up the country as a major snowmaker. Tens of thousands in its path are still without power with the storm leaving double-digit snow amounts in at least 11 states. Chaos on the coast as a fierce winter storm brings a barrage of snow, freezing rain and high-powered winds this Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Super windy, a lot of stuff flying out everywhere. Tonight, tens of thousands are in the dark as residents dig out of double-digit totals in at least 11 states, a staggering 22 inches in upstate New York and 14 in Des Moines, the city's worst snowstorm in more than a decade. In Pittsburgh, even first responders struggling to get around. Flakes falling at a fast clip, up to five inches an hour, making for treacherous conditions on the roads. In North Carolina, this tractor trailer sliding off a bridge. And at least two people died after a crash on I-95. Winds packing a punch, up to 70 mile an hour gusts in cities like New York and Boston. Powering monstrous waves in Massachusetts and flooding coastal communities. It's amazing, you know, that it's breached this point. The days-long winter wallop impacting the majority of states, from Maine to Florida, where cleanup crews face a mangled mess after five reported tornadoes tore through dozens of homes. We made it inside, and 10 seconds later, it hit. And tonight, the travel nightmare persists. More than 1,500 flights canceled in the U.S. today after 3,000 were grounded Sunday. It has been crazy, really bad. A winter weather beatdown that forecasters warn won't be this season's last. Ukraine, caught in the crossfires of international superpowers, is pleading to the West for support against Russia. In doing so, ex-president Petro Poroshenko has been recalled to face the judiciary for charges of treason by supporting their Russian oppressor. Ukraine's former president Petro Poroshenko landed in Kiev on Monday to face treason charges, which he says were trumped up by allies of his successor, President Volodymyr Zelensky. His return sets up a showdown that critics see as an ill-judged distraction. Ukraine is currently bracing for a possible Russian military offensive and appealing to Western allies for support. In a brief standoff at border control after arriving on a flight from Warsaw, Poroshenko accused border guards of taking away his passport. Then he addressed flag-waving supporters outside the airport. The treason allegations relate to the financing of Russian-backed separatist fighters through illegal coal sales in 2014 to 15, while he was president. Western diplomats called for political unity in Ukraine ahead of Poroshenko's arrival. Poroshenko's party accused Zelensky of a reckless attempt to silence political opposition. Zelensky's administration says the prosecutors and judiciary are independent and accuses Poroshenko of thinking he is above the law. Ukraine and its allies have sounded the alarm about tens of thousands of Russian troops massed near its borders. After days of diplomacy last week achieved no breakthrough, the United States said Russia was preparing a pretext for an attack, something the Kremlin dismissed as unfounded. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. The European Parliament is widely expected to elect Conservative Maltese lawmaker Roberta Metzloa as its president, making her the EU Assembly's first woman president in 20 years. The funeral of David Sassoli in Rome. European leaders pay their last respects. The president of the European Parliament died a week ago, a few days before the end of his mandate. Right of picture, the woman expected to succeed him, Roberta Metzola, a 43-year-old Maltese MEP and the current interim president. Before entering European Parliament in Strasbourg in 2013, she studied at the prestigious College of Bruges. 
Vice President of Parliament since November 2020, her election would be a strong signal to smaller member states. The right-wing candidate has earned her colleagues' respect for work on various social issues, such as LGBTI rights and processing and relocating migrants within the bloc, an important issue in Malta, a Mediterranean island. The immediate uh, uh, need that there is is to save lives. Uh, people, hundreds of them, are drowning uh, on our, in our seas. And it is our responsibility in the European Parliament, but primarily as Prime Ministers in the European Council, to find um, enough assets to be able to save those hundreds of lives. Another key subject in her home country is abortion. Malta is the only EU member to have a total ban on the procedure, and that's backed by Metzora. She's staunchly anti-abortion, which puts her at odds with many on the centre-left. On the legal front, regulating abortion within the bloc does not fall within the competence of the European Parliament, but a Metzola presidency would be seen by some as sending the wrong signal. Until now, only two women have presided over the institution, including Simone Veil, at the origin of the law legalizing abortion in France. A French court found far-right presidential hopeful Eric Zemmour guilty of racist hate speech for a tirade against unaccompanied child migrants. French far-right presidential candidate Eric Zemmour was fined more than 11,000 US dollars on Monday for inciting racial hatred. It's over remarks in which he called young migrants killers, thieves and rapists. Zamor, a former political commentator, is competing with the more established far-right candidate Marine Le Pen and conservative Valérie Pécresse to challenge centre-right President Emmanuel Macron in April's presidential election. The French court case concerned remarks he made on right-wing channel C News in 2020 about migrants who arrive as unaccompanied children. He said, quote, they've got no reason for being here. They're thieves, they're killers, they're rapists. That's all they do. They should be sent back. For several weeks last year, opinion polls indicated that Zemmour, who also has previous convictions for inciting racial hatred, had a chance of placing second in the presidential poll and facing Macron in a runoff. His campaign has since lost some steam and he now polls fourth. Zemmour said he would appeal the ruling. He stood by his 2020 comments, adding that the court was condemning him for expressing his views. Security forces shot and killed seven protesters during rallies against last year's military coup. Medics said ahead of a visit by US diplomats seeking to revive a transition to civilian rule. The sound of gunshots in the capital Khartoum as tear gas is used to disperse the crowd. Demonstrators are faced with heavily armed security forces. Monday's protest was one of the deadliest days in Sudan since October's military coup. Protesters are once again demanding a transition to civilian rule. I am here today to resist the military coup that happened on October 25th. We hope our revolution reaches a civilian democratic path and hopefully the Sudanese people will achieve all their goals. I'm against tyranny, dictatorships and any regime that stands against people's freedom or justice. I'm against inequality among the Sudanese people, whether that's in fortune distribution, freedom of speech or any other thing. October's coup struck a blow to hopes of a democratic transition in the northeast African country. The turmoil was amplified by the resignation of civilian Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok earlier this month. The pro-democracy movement condemned the shootings and has called for a two-day campaign of civil disobedience. The US has dispatched envoys to Sudan to urge an end to the violence. The U.S. airlines are warning of a catastrophic disruption if the telecom industry goes ahead with the plans to turn on the new 5G wireless technology that could affect a critical flight instrument on planes. Just 36 hours before Verizon and AT&T switch on their new faster 5G cell systems, airlines today issued a stark warning, an urgent request signed by every major U.S. airline and cargo CEO. 
for the government to keep the 5G ground stations turned off if they're within two miles of major airports. The CEO's right, immediate intervention is needed to avoid significant operational disruption to air passengers, shippers, supply chain, and delivery of needed medical supplies. 50, 40. The concern, those 5G ground stations could disrupt a plane's radial altimeter, which provides precise altitude readings when pilots land in poor visibility. As 5G goes live Wednesday, the FAA will prohibit pilots from using altimeters during landing at more than 80 airports near 5G sites, including large airport hubs in Dallas, New York, Chicago, and Seattle. Today, the airline CEOs warned the vast majority of the traveling and shipping public will essentially be grounded, facing cancellations, diversions, or delays. The FAA has issued an airworthiness directive that would significantly impact our operations. The cell phone industry insists the technology has proven to be safe in Europe. It's already delayed rollout twice and says it'll turn down the power at ground stations near some airports. Look, the wireless carriers are impatient to deploy technology that uh, stands to make a big impact, a positive impact on our economy. Uh, but on the aviation side, we've also got to make sure that it's safe. Many parents hoped end-of-year holidays and vacation could lead to a better sense of peace, if not normalcy, with respect to the ongoing pandemic. Instead, as we head into the third year of COVID-19, Georgia is seeing its highest case counts, particularly among children, since the virus appeared. Much of that comes thanks to the Omicron variant. What's your favorite color? Blue. Doctors and nurses at this children's hospital in Augusta, Georgia, have noticed a huge spike in Omicron cases as the COVID-19 variant rages across the United States. Dr. Jacob Eichenberger works at the Children's Hospital of Georgia. Yeah, so this Omicron wave um, has really been, we have matched our worst Delta wave um, with hospitalizations and then even more than that are clinic visits for what might be considered mild cases, but it's overwhelming clinics and emergency departments with just the number of kids coming in with um, fevers and real sore throats and um, it's just a large volume of visits. Karen Wilson is a nurse at the Children's Hospital. It's been very busy because uh, since this was down a little bit coming up to the holidays and after the holidays, it has been really, um, since this has been very high. Um, we've had a lot of children coming in with the Omicron, um, with COVID, so it's been intense. Children below the age of five who are not eligible to get the vaccine for COVID-19 remain at higher risk of catching the virus as a result. Hannah Mills, the mother of three-month-old Baker, said her son's symptoms are mild. Last week, the United States broke a global record for the number of new coronavirus infections in a day, hitting 1.35 million cases on January 10th. In Georgia, weekly data collected on January 13th showed nearly 22,000 cases for all children under the age of 18. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Activision Blizzard fired or pushed out more than three dozen employees and disciplined another 40 since July to address allegations of sexual harassment and other misconduct at the video game company. Equatorial Guinea led a string of upsets at the Africa Cup of Nations soccer tournament when they beat defending champions Algeria, while Ivory Coast and Mali were both held to draws by unfancied opponents. Amazon halts ban on UK-issued Visa credit cards, adding that it was working with Visa to resolve a dispute over payment fees. A six-year cold case investigation into the betrayal of Anne Frank has identified a surprising suspect in the mystery of how the Nazis found the hiding place of the famous diarist in 1944. This new revelation comes to light 77 years after the incident occurred. The world's 10 wealthiest men doubled their fortunes during the first two years of the coronavirus pandemic as poverty and inequality soared. The super rich keep getting richer. That's part of the findings from a new report on inequality. According to Oxfam, the world's 10 richest people now own around one and a half trillion dollars. 
The charity says the world's 10 richest people have boosted their fortunes by $15,000 a second or $1.3 billion a day during the pandemic. At the same time, global inequality is contributing to the death of one person every four seconds. Oxfam says more than 160 million people have been plunged into poverty since the start of the pandemic. To counter this growing inequality, the charity is urging governments to impose a temporary wealth tax of up to 99 percent to fund vaccines for the poor, universal health care and social protections. Oxfam is also warning that the pandemic has set back gender equality. In 2020, women lost $800 billion in earnings, and there are 13 million fewer women working now than in 2019. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed any of the stories we had tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with a look at a group of unusual friends playing along in the snow. Thank you for joining us. Good night.